Silence. Am, am I on now? Okay, excellent. Welcome and good evening. Thanks to everyone for coming out to Luther College for this exciting event, Common Cause, that features Phoebe Ferguson and Keith Plessy in conversation with Luther College President Jennifer J. Ward. We'll open tonight with a land acknowledgement. The land on which Luther College stands has been home to the Iowa, Sac, Fox, and Dakota people and their ancestors. As part of the neutral ground created by the US government to control the movement, lives, and livelihood of native peoples, this land was home to the Winnebago Ho-Chunk during their forced displacement from Wisconsin. This dispossession of the Iowa, Sac, Fox, and Dakota, and the forced migration of the Winnebago Ho-Chunk people was motivated by the interests of settlers, such as those who founded this town and this college. The Winnebago, during their residence here, addressed the land as grandmother. The tribe's orator, Wakan Decora, believed his people were extended the blessing of this place by the Great Spirit, saying, we did not make it, nor could we make it so pretty and fair a land. Please honor this history and the ongoing connection of the descendants of these early residents to this place. Please also honor and care for the land, water, and resources as these residents did, like a loved and loving elder to whom we owe our life. I'm Andy Hageman, director of the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement, what we call the Keep at Luther. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Keep and the President's Office. At the Keep, our mission is to encourage students, and all of us really, to reflect on our ethical responsibilities and opportunities, to utilize our education in day-to-day -day life, and to take action to contribute to our communities. As with all of the Keep's events, we've invited a current Luther College student to introduce our guests. So I'd like to welcome to the stage, Elise Trail Johnson, to do that honor. studies with a visual communication and museum studies minors. Um, I'm thrilled to announce this event as I have a deep interest in cultivating reconciliation across differences. This summer, I, along with two other current students who are in their way right now, uh, have the honor of representing Luther as a part of the Peace Scholar Program in Norway. Um, which is an outgrowth of the Nobel Peace Prize. Which is an outgrowth. We, as well as a handful of other students from Norwegian-founded higher ed institutions in the United States, will spend about two months uh, studying at the Nansen Dialogue Network in Lillehammer and the University of Oslo International Summer School. We will be studying peace and conflict resolution, meaning everything from inner contentment to interpersonal understanding to political conflict and amity. In our increasingly individualistic society, we feel like we have weaker connections with others, especially across differences. Uh, and we tend to hold the dangerous assumption that we don't have much to learn from others. 
It makes us socially and politically isolated, leaves vital lessons unshared, and allows for the reinforcement of harmful stereotypes. Seeking out conversation across differences as a form of striving for peace is a great starting point, um, and especially when it's intentional. Um, and these conversations, I feel like, are really integral to creating change. If we don't pay attention to history, we are doomed to repeat it. Our country these days has begun to cross this threshold yet again with uh, book bannings, hate-based legislation, and seemingly never-ending violence. Sometimes it's difficult to have hope for change um, when day in and day out we are constantly presented with more and more reasons to lose hope. Tonight, we will have two people, three people on stage that represent what hope looks like. <laughs> Keith Plessy and Phoebe Ferguson are descendants of opposite sides of one of the most instrumental Supreme Court cases in United States history, Plessy versus Ferguson. I'm sure that most of you have some familiarity with the case, um, but to give a brief overview, over a century ago in 1896, the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court case established in law the idea of separate but equal, um, which led to decades of legalized segregation until the court's historic Brown versus Board of Education ruling in 1954. Even though the unjust ruling is not in law anymore, racial discrimination and remnants of this case's ideals are still very present, present in America today. Keith Plessy and uh, Phoebe Ferguson are here tonight all the way from New Orleans, where their foundation Plessy and Ferguson is based. For the past 14 or so years, um, they have worked together as friends and colleagues to create positive change by focusing on education, preservation of history, an outreach about racial discrimination and reconciliation. They are advocates for justice, equity, and attempt for understanding through conversation. Uh, they visit schools and institutions worldwide to spread their message that mutual history and conflict can be an opportunity for peace building. They aim to inspire communities to connect with their own local histor historical legacies in order to understand who they are, where they have come from, and what a better future could look like for them. Additionally, the foundation started the Historical Marker Project in New Orleans, which places physical historical markers honoring locations significant to African American history throughout the city. President Ward has been president at Luther College since the fall of 2019 and boasts an impressive resume of higher ed employment and achievements. She was instrumental in making this conversation possible tonight and will be joining in the conversation with Phoebe and Keith. And tonight will go as follows. When I'm done here, President Ward will facilitate the conversation with Keith and Phoebe. And then in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the hour, I will come back up on stage and facilitate a Q&A based on questions that were previously collected from the Luther community. Um, the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement Office, who is co-sponsoring this event, has compiled a few of the most representative questions from the collection to ask our guests tonight. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Keith Plessy, Phoebe Ferguson, and President Ward. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Andy, for co-hosting this event uh, tonight. I know it was uh, some work for you to do with lots of other Keith events, and so I'm, I'm really grateful to you and your team. Um, I first got to know Keith and Phoebe when I lived and worked in Louisiana. Um, we were trying to remember if it was 2017 or 2018. Uh, and I first had the idea to invite them to Luther to be our commencement speakers last year uh, when I saw on the news that this was on January 5th, 2022, that Governor John Bell Edwards of Louisiana had signed an official pardon to exonerate Homer Plessy posthumously and to honor him for his courage. Uh, as you might know, Keith and Phoebe were going to be our commencement speakers, in fact, last year, uh, but uh, we're, I read their remarks <laughs> uh, for them because of uh, COVID, um, but I'm so happy that it worked out to bring you to campus this year. So back to the governor's pardon. It took 125 years but partly due to Keith and Phoebe's perseverance, justice came to Homer. Keith and Phoebe, take us back to that day. 
How had you come to meet and work together? And what was it like to see the fruits of some of your labor result in this pardon? Well, we met in 2004, one year before Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. And um, we were introduced by an author who wrote a book about both our ancestors. And we were not aware of our ancestors as much as this gentleman was. So <laughs> we trusted his knowledge and his research. His name was Keith, his name is Keith Welton Nevin. He's pres presently not doing very well. Uh, he was in great shape then. And I met him in 1996 at the 100th anniversary of Plessy v. Ferguson's decision. And there was a big gathering in New Orleans to commemorate the case. And that's where I met Mr. Medley when he was doing his research. So uh, fast forward to 2004 when we met. Phoebe had uh, just found out about her ancestor and she was looking for some way to express, you know, uh, and dig up the information. Because, uh, and I'll let her explain that part when I get to her, but I'll tell my side first. Um, so when I get to meet Phoebe, I was told that I was gonna meet her first because I knew Keith Bentley since 1996, it was 2004, and Phoebe had just met him. So he set the stage and when we met at his book signing, he said, do you want to meet her Ferguson? So me knowing I was going to meet her, I was OK. You know, it had Phoebe in total shock. Just she didn't know she was going to meet me. So she began to apologize for segregation. <laughs> Before I apologize, the best part was that she walks up. Uh, and I come into the to the building, and Keith walks towards me, and he puts out his hand and says, "Hi, I'm Keith Plessy." I'm like, "Hi, I'm Keith Ferguson." I'm so sorry. Everything my ancestors did, and all that slavery and discrimination. <laughs> so uh, my reply to her was, "It's no longer Plessy versus Ferguson; it's Plessy and Ferguson." Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that that was going to be the name of our foundation at the time, because it took us five years to listen to archivists, historians, authors like Keith Bevin, to convince us that what we had done was something really powerful. We had a natural reconciliation take place. You know, in South Africa, when they had to reconcile the differences when Nelson Mandela became president, they had to have it all arranged. So you had to have a meeting. Somebody had to apologize. Somebody had to accept the apology and forgive them. So we did all that in one swoop. <laughs> and we were not aware of it. So the people around us who was who were aware of it made us aware. And five years later, uh, we formed the foundation. But Phoebe, it's interesting how you found out about your background. And your ancestors through Keith. Yes. So thank tell you. your story. I will. Thank you. So I um, I was living and working in New York at the time. I had my I'm from New Orleans, but I lived there and worked there as a commercial photographer and then um, as a filmmaker. And I got a call one day from a gentleman who said he'd been looking for a Ferguson for ten years. And was I one of those family members? And I said, yes, yes, I, I am related to all those people. <laughs> he said, well, I bought your great-great-grandfather's house. You know, the judge in Plessy versus Ferguson. And I thought, oh no, could this be true? Because I had thought about it. But at that moment, I actually had received um, a box from my sister. And I knew that on the top of the box was an envelope that said Ferguson genealogy on it. So while I was on the phone with him, I reached into the envelope, I pulled out the genealogy, and I went, oh, Judge John Howard Ferguson. Sure, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I, I came down to, um, to meet him and see the house. And I know this is a really little thing, but his name was Clessy. 
you know, just like, okay. But anyway, um, that was my introduction. And um, Keith Medley was so excited because he spent 25 years researching the history, the New Orleans story leading up to the Supreme Court. The story that is not told. And who were the people that strategized and, you know, created the first real strategy around civil disobedience? And how did that case ever get from New Orleans in a small state case law all the way to the Supreme Court? So, um, so, so he was so excited now that he had both Plessy and Ferguson. He just couldn't like contain himself. And but but the thing was, when I was looking for something about the judge, um, the librarian at um, LSU said, "Well, we don't have any of the judge's papers, but there's this book that was just published, and there's an entire chapter about your great great grandfather." Mm -hmm. So that's how I met Keith Medley and. And just a little plug for the author again. His title of his book is We as Freemen. And it's the struggle of civil rights in Louisiana, Blessing versus Ferguson. Um, it gave us the full story of our ancestors. So to see all of that happen, and what almost 12 years later, after five markers being placed around the city of New Orleans, I think we assisted with two other markers, one for AP Turo and one in Bogalusa, Louisiana. For the Deacons for Defense, I don't know if you ever heard of those guys. They went to Bogalusa, Louisiana, and they actually ran the Klan out of Bogalusa with automatic weapons. Um, and they got the weapons from the docks in New Orleans. So we know the family, the Hicks family. We got to meet uh, the Little Rock Nine, the first year we formed. We got to meet the Brown family in Topeka, Kansas, all courtesy of the National Park Service. We recognized what we did by forming the foundation, and they invited us to these events. So um, the five markers up later, we uh, are called, you got the call from attorney Mary Howell. Mm -hmm. And we always celebrated Plessy Day. He was arrested on June 7, 1892. And in 2005, one year after we met, the state of Louisiana recognized June 7th in 2005 as Homer Plessy Day statewide. So he was awarded that honor, but never exonerated. So fast forward to Mary Howell making that call to you. So uh, well, tell us about okay. that. Um, we have a local civil rights attorney um, in New Orleans who is just one of those people. She's been around for a long time. She has worked as a public defender in so many cases around the country, not just New Orleans. But anyway, she's just a remarkable woman. And she was rereading Keith Medley's book. And she happened on the uh, uh, fact that, that uh, on January 11, 1897, Homer Plessy had to plead guilty and pay the $25 fine because he lost in the Supreme Court, right? And by doing that, um, he was then a convicted felon, which is not what we think about that often, but that's what he was. He then, you know, went back to life, um, you know, and he will tell you about how he, you know, moved on and got other work, but, um, Mary's idea was, she said, I know you've celebrated a lot of things around, you know, the Plessy history, but have you ever um, celebrated the day he got convicted? I mean, that's been fine. Well, no, Mary, we, ha we haven't done it. She said, well, given that at this moment in history, we have in, have in the world a progressive DA office, and this DA, when he got into office, he started the civil rights office inside the prosecutor's office, right? And the first thing he did was hire um, 
woman named Emily Ma, who had been the director of the Innocence Project for 17 years. So their mission was how can we reduce past harms that were done to the mostly black community? And it didn't matter what the time period was. So if there was a case which they considered um, to have uh, been egregiously prosecuted and wrongly or so wrongly convicted, um, they would look into that history and you know bring that forward. So um, yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying about the classic day, June seventh, traditionally for twelve years we celebrated classic day as a foundation. We had never celebrated the day I met Keith Bradley, which was the anniversary of the decision, which was May 18th. So in 2021, uh, we can talk about a book that came out in 2021. That was in February. And I'll tell about that book later. But in that same year, we decided as a foundation to have a virtual, since COVID was taking over everything, we decided to have a virtual uh, celebration about the case on, on May 18th to celebrate that year. It was the 125th anniversary of the case. And we just, uh, to say, you know, like, you know, how, all the, how did it feel to see it all coming to fruition? Michelle Miller, who worked for the local CBS channel in, in 1996, interviewed me at the celebration in New Orleans when I knew absolutely nothing about this. So 25 years later, for the 125th anniversary, because that was the 100th anniversary. 25 years later, Michelle Miller interviews us on CBS on that day because we had the virtual celebration that day in some kind of way. I don't know how it happened in the universe, but Michelle Miller shows up and she interviews us on CBS and we get this exposure. And Mary Howell makes that call not too long after that to tell us that another date was coming up for the 125th anniversary. It was almost blessed conviction. And with all those elements with the DA being progressive and having a civil rights division in his office, we decided we were going to approach him about the pardon. So, mutual agreement amongst Phoebe, Mary Howell, and myself, we all had a discussion about it. We approached the DA and they jumped on it. And they immediately went to work in the civil rights division and found a pardon law called the Avery Alexander Pardon Law. Now, he was an activist in New Orleans during the sit-ins, the freedom riots, and so forth. And Senator Edwin Murray wrote that law so that people who were arrested during the sit-ins and uh, the freedom riots could have a pardon because the law itself was a crime. They did not commit crimes trying to ride a bus or sit in a county to eat. So his law had Avery Alexander's name on it. It's just short on Avery Alexander. He protested in City Hall for employees that worked in City Hall to eat in the cafeteria with white patrons who also worked in City Hall. Police department dragged him up the steps while his head was bouncing on the stairs. Dragged him all the way up the stairs from the basement. And he survived that attack. He survived many organizations that gathered with him for voting rights, housing, the whole thing. So they had his name on the part and it was great, but we didn't know we could use it for home of Plessy. So Mary, being the genius she was and bringing it to us, had already figured out if we could get this pardon law to the Board of Pardons, we would possibly get a pardon for home of Plessy after 125 years of his conviction. So when we approached the pardon board, it was November the 12th in the morning, and in 15 minutes, we had a pardon for Homer Pleasant. He was the first to use a law that was created in 2006 and set on the books. And his 125 year conviction was lifted in 15 minutes. And immediately we got attention from an international peace group called Search for Common Ground. Phoebe got that call again. She just answers the phone all the time. You know, never came this out. But uh, they, invited us to New York on the 19th of November, that same year in 2021, and we received a World Peace Award that we were totally 
unaware that we had affected the world. But we did have a glimpse on November 12th because after the pardon was awarded, we tried to drive in the car and get away from the reporters in New Orleans. And the Washington Post called, <clears throat> the New York Times called. Some kind of way they had our numbers. And when we looked at the internet, the news had reached Taiwan, China, in the UK by four o'clock that afternoon. So I we understand now why I searched for Common Brown paid so much attention to what happened. Um, so to say that we started out just with a friendship and a handshake and just having faith in each other as human beings and being intentional about our friendship, it led to all that. So when the actual signing happened, when John Bell Edwards signed, he actually signed at the site of where Homer Plessy bought the ticket for the whites only car. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And you were there, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We anticipated. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Um, yeah. yeah. I would suggest um, you can see the ceremony. The microphone. Oh, I'm so sorry. You can see the ceremony online if you just put in. Uh, pardon and Homer Plessy or Homer Plessy's pardon and governor, you know, Louisiana governor pardons Homer Plessy. Um, and I encourage it because the people who spoke that day were so powerful in their words and, you know, why this was important. Because, of course, there were people, you know, we could see in social media that people, some people thought, you know, why do we care? It's been 125 years, he's dead, what's the big deal? And, um, but that was a very small fraction because when we saw the reaction of the country th through numerous, numerous, numerous articles saying that Homer Plessy had been pardoned and the reaction was of relief. There were people who called in tears um, you know, people who had lived through the struggle and never thought that this kind of thing would happen. And, you know, this is, this is kind of where we are now in a very uh, important juncture in our understanding of the value of, of, um, um, reckoning with history and then um, doing something that actually does reduce past harms and says that we're acknowledging this happened, this horrible thing happened. And the governor of Louisiana apologized for the law that the state had written at the time. And apologies apparently are difficult for a lot of people and states just don't like to do it. But he did a beautiful job and he really, really read this history and it meant a lot to him and he embraced everyone there. And as you may know, um, speaking of the signatures on the pardon, if you would like to say who all participated. Well, just to kind of recap some of the events that day, to open the event, there was a cellist, a nationally renowned cellist, who happened to be the great great granddaughter of John Marshall Harlan, the only dissenting Supreme Court justice in that case where Homer Plessy was convicted in U.S. Supreme Court. We met three sisters who are great great granddaughters of John Marshall Harlan. And if you Google the CBS interview, we are sitting at, just like we're sitting here, we're sitting with one of the descendants of John Marshall Harlan. And, um, you know, the governor, um, to me, the, the other people, you say, well, who signed the pardon? Well, Phoebe signed, I signed, the district attorney signed to ask for forgiveness, actually, not for, you know, Homer Plessy to be pardoned, but to ask for forgiveness of the DA's department for having that stain on the state of Louisiana for convicting him. And there's a group called the Martinette Society. And one of the lead lawyers for Homer Plessy was Louis A. Martinette, very famous lawyer in, in New Orleans. 
and uh, his legacy lives on in 300 lawyers in an organization called the Martin Ness Society. So the president of that organization signed to ask the Board of Pardons to grant that pardon. And we also had his descendant, Ken Martin, who lives in California, sign also. Um, the Harlan Daughter signed. And who else? Our relatives. Yeah, we signed. You signed for your cousin, yeah. um, John I'm, Howard Ferguson the fourth. Yeah. I signed for my brother who passed away, his oldest daughter. I put her name in. And uh, one of my cousins who's alive, Stephen Plessman, he also signed. So when we presented it to the Board of Pardons, we had that historical signature list for them to look at as they were making the decision. So it was easy for them. But just to fast forward to the governor, which I was thinking about him, he had 14 days to sign that pardon legally. He told us no. And he wanted to do this. He said, not in 14 days, but in public, we want to do this pardon and we want to apologize for the sin that was left on the state. Louisiana knows how to do ritual moments. <laughs> <laughs> they can talk. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the remarks that you sent me to read for you at uh, commencement, uh, you said, and I quote, we were not chosen to speak to you today because we have found a solution to climate change or are beloved in the world of sports or are the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize. We are here today because we are unlikely friends, end quote. You had every reason to be enemies. What was at stake for you when you decided that the path forward had to be as friends as Plessy and Ferguson and not Plessy versus Ferguson? Well, I know that at the time I was prepared because as a child coming up, Phoebe was introduced to her ancestors' history in what, 2000, you know, like a, yeah, something like that. But back in the 60s, when I was attending elementary school, my teachers prepared me, and the books were very limited. It only spoke of the case, the separate but equal decision, and, you know, segregation that followed. Basically, it was a one, two, three. Never talked about the strategic plan that happened amongst 18 prominent citizens of New Orleans who happened to be black and white and other nationalities who participated in that movement, which was a early civil rights movement in the 19th century. And these guys closed out the 19th century going into the 20th century by making a statement that even though they knew they were going to lose in the U.S. Supreme Court, they still challenged the law and made it a record. So to make that a record, they they had something that went on the books that could be challenged. And it took 58 years for that to change in the Brown decision. And it was kind of a de facto thing because they, even though they overturned blessing, there was education that they were talking about and inequalities of education, but in transportation, buses were continued to be attacked. If there were white and black passengers on the bus. You had to sit in the back of a bus if you were in Montgomery, Alabama, according to Rosa Parks. And, you know, the Freedom Riders in the 60s, that was 1955 with Rosa Parks. And in the 60s, there were buses being burned in, in uh, Jackson, Mississippi with the Freedom Riders. And by the way, the Freedom Riders refer to Homer Plessis as the first Freedom Riders. So I, I, I proudly accept that <laughs> because we know some of the survivors of the Freedom Rise. They still live in New Orleans. They were all in the New Orleans chapter court, the Congress of Racial Equality, and they all marched. And it, you know, we're still waiting for a civil rights museum in New Orleans, but I think we just have to keep pushing. But in Jackson, Mississippi, we experienced their museum, and in Montgomery, Alabama, we experienced their museum in one trip over the weekend, a couple of weeks back. So I think what's at stake and what we were faced with at that time was pretty much the knowledge of everything that Keith just said and the opportunity, because of that history, the opportunity for the two of us to, to make a difference. 
And if even metaphorically, or, you know, we're not Plessy and we're not Ferguson, but we are <clears throat> ancestors and, you know, this is, this, there wasn't ever a moment where I questioned it. Um, at the pardon ceremony afterwards, um, one of our congressmen came up to me and he took both my hands in his hands and he said, he's black, he said, you're very brave. You didn't have to do this. And the thought never occurred to me that I didn't have to do this because it was an incredible opportunity. It changed my life completely. And I'll speak for Keith, but um, I came back to New Orleans from New York in order to see what the next thing was going to be. How are we going to do this? What were we going to do? And why is this going to make a difference to anybody else? I love this idea of these forced detours almost, where you, you come down there to see the house mm -hmm. and all of this unfolds and then you decide it's time to go home yes. because there's work to do at home. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know that you both have backgrounds in the arts. Um, I often wondered if your ability to make common cause uh, and to become unlikely friends uh, was made easier by being in the business of observing and creating, of taking unlikely materials or ideas, seeing the potential in them, and then creating, generating something bigger and better than the sum of its parts. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I can definitely say that as a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, um, I learned the power of story. And through that process, there's this thing that happens when you're interviewing someone who you really don't know. But you're asking them to reveal parts of themselves that they really haven't re revealed before, but they somehow understand the importance of them speaking now and in, into the camera. That was the interesting part was as soon as the camera was there, they could relate their story. And then the craft of taking those stories, those transcripts, and creating, you know, an arc of the beginning, the struggle, and the resolution, I think um, is has definitely fed into the work we do now from my artistic background. <laughs> well, the short version is with your sensibility in the arts, with, with your history of being an arts maker, of creating and generating and observing, has that contributed to the way in which you were able to create this and with Phoebe? <laughs> yeah, I would say um, the school that you mentioned, uh, well, actually the place where Homer Plessy was arrested, is now the New Orleans Center for Creative Art. I'm a 1976 graduate of the New Orleans Center for Creative Art. And uh, I attended when it was called Tulane University and University of New Orleans. It wasn't in that location, but they moved it to that spot. So my experience as an artist and the connection to my ancestors' history taking place on that property. When all those things came together, you know, it just it just was like a full circle for me. And not that I created the artwork to celebrate it, but there was there was a, a chance to take that area because the, the people, the administration there had understood connection to my ancestor and my history as a student. 
So I was invited to several events. We matter of fact, we had our first events at that location. So the full circle came around with the party happening on the same property, but it was also the place where Homer Plessy bought the ticket, was thrown off the train and arrested right at the corner where the marker now stands in the street. One of the full circles that happened before the pardon was the street was called Press Street. And five blocks of it was from like St. Claude Avenue to the river and there was no houses or anything, all railroad tracks, whatnot. So when we decided we were gonna get that name changed because press actually refers to the cotton press. Mm -hmm. And the school, NOCA, was formerly the cotton press. Mm -hmm. It was a train station later, and it was formerly where they processed cotton. It was picked by slaves. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to take that name away and name it Homer Plessy Way. So on the day when we got the approval, and we got the councilman and um, congressman uh, Cedric Richmond came to, to do the celebration. We also had an artist at the time named Io Scott, who actually is on the cover of our book together. Another plug for a book. Um, <laughs> but uh, you'll hear about that too. Um, but the artist, Io Scott, is the son of John Scott, who passed away. He was the Xavier art director at the time when Plessy Day was developed, and he was trying to do some artwork in that area. So when he passed away, we didn't know that his son was going to be the one to do a large mural to commemorate Plessy versus Ferguson. And on the day we dedicated the street, his mural was being dedicated as well. So I had, I had a golden opportunity and it just brought back all of my memories as being an artist in that school. And I had a chance to thank Ellis Marcellus and other fellow his sons, Whitney and Bradford. But they were also students of NOCA. And uh, had a chance to thank him because he kind of saved my life. Just, you know, when I lost my mother during my year, I was about to graduate. Mr. Marcellus came through. So I have to say, you know, being an artist had, had a big effect on it. And it, it gave me a lot of fulfillment, you know, to, to be part of the celebrations that are constantly happening. And I tell you, most of this has been a lot of just doing the right thing that brings around things that happen right. And it's surprised me a lot in the beginning, but it's not surprising me now. So I'm, 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 I really am so grateful that we're here. And you all should be proud of this college because I talked to some of your students today and I have new motivation to do more work until I leave this earth. <laughs> so you know, and I want to do it for them so they can do it for the next generation. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Elise, who's going to um, offer some questions that, that came from the students. So this question is about activism, about ethics, and about commitments. How do you hold space for idealism and an unwavering commitment to a cause while working with people or organizations that are not where you are in their journey? When are you unwavering, and when are you patient? Market number two. <laughs> <laughs> Market number two. Uh, we did Plessy versus Ferguson in 2009, and the very next year, 2010, there was this. The author of the book, once again, Keith Bentley, got to give him his kudos, kudos, or whatever you can say that. Um, <laughs> anyway, this guy had told us he was actually the prophet for the Marvels. He told us once that if another Katrina ever happened to New Orleans and we didn't put up symbols of our courage and our commitment, that they'd never know that black people existed in New Orleans. So he set us on a path to get these markers done. And the second year out in 2010, and I, I'm going to say a name, and I know you all know this name, it's Ruby Bridges. Everybody familiar with that name? Are you aware that it was? Four girls that integrated two public schools on that day, and she supposedly integrated one public school in New Orleans. Well, that's the truth. In, in 1952, there was a case filed, Earl Benjamin Bush versus Orleans Parish School Board. Earl Benjamin Bush was a 
young man, six years old, ready to go to elementary school, and um, it never happened. And in 1954, Brown happened. But in 1952, the same people that filed Brown filed Earl Benjamin Bush versus all these parish public schools. So the, the Louisiana legislature was so stubborn that even after Brown, it took them six years to implement their integrating their public schools at all of them would speak, according to the U.S. Supreme Court. So when they made the decision to do it, there was four girls that were selected and two schools that were selected to be integrated. The upper ninth ward was William France, and then of course was Ruby Bridges, all true. Three girls, the only take Tessa Prevost, Tessa, I'll say, the only take Gail Etienne, Tessa Prevost, to get the letters right, they integrated McDonough 19. So the story was just ignored that it was four girls and the media ran away with the one story. So the marker we put up in 2010 was to commemorate the school where they integrated so we could get the whole story told. We had the story of all four girls. We had the story of the case, Benjamin Bush versus all his past school boy, all on the marker. And we put it in a neutral ground. We call it neutral ground, everybody call it media. It's a green area that goes between two-way traffic. <laughs> so we placed it directly in front of the front door of that school because the school board wanted to tear it down in 2010. But patience. The lady by the name of Leona Tate, who was one of the girls who integrated the school, had a foundation the same year we formed ours in 2009. And she kept fighting. We put the marker there, the school board couldn't tear down the school. She kept fighting and fighting. And just recently, in 2019, no, you came? So she finally got funding to repair the school. And now it's called the TEP Center, T-E-P for Tate Etienne Prevost. And it's an interpretive center that tells the story of their plight in the, I would say, integration crisis in New Orleans in 1960. And it's repaired in a sense where it takes care of the young, and it takes care of the old. Because on the second floor and the third floor is 25 elderly living spaces, affordable. And the stories being told on that first floor about their integration crisis. And there's a group called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, and they teach anti racism classes. So that has become a mega to peace where discrimination was a poison that tried to stop them from being students in their school. And our walker, with patience of about maybe, what, 12 years, it, it resulted in that happened to that school. And we always worked with the owner, even though the progress was very slow. We always supported him. And the year that we got the pardon, I had, for a few months, stepped in there as her uh, chairman of the board, and I kind of helped them do their meetings and so forth. And as soon as the pardon happened, I had to leave. We had too much to do. <laughs> but we, we had connected with other organizations, and that was one of the most successful stories that I can remember that we were involved in. Because uh, it, it's actually a mecca of peace. You know, Leon always says that's the place where they first learned about segregation and hatred, but it's the place where they're going to end it. Do you want to add anything, or shall we bring Elisa? I think maybe Elisa. Elisa, you want to come represent all of the student body? Elisa, <laughs> 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 you want to take my mic? Sure. Yes. Oh, one more thing, folks. You can Google McDonough 3. And as a CBS report, if you Google McDonald 3, you'll get a story of those three women. And uh, Gail King on CBS will be making his comment at the end of the show. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, she says she had never heard of them before. So now you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the usual, the soft block button. Yeah. Okay, so like I said at the beginning, um, these questions were uh, collected 
from Luther students in the greater decor community. Um, so, yeah, they're exciting. Um, <laughs> the first one that I have for you is um, that like talking about racism in a classroom can be unsettling for a lot of people um, and for a number of reasons. It's complicated. Um, how do you recommend that folks take risks in the classroom? And what are some of the outcomes that you have seen from these conversations? And do you have any recommendations about how to shape these conversations? Okay. Uh, well, first I, I want to you know, say that we, we are not trained educators. Uh, we are descendants. And um, the way in which we have always been able to engage people and start conversations is through our personal story. And the, the, the thing that, telling your story is a tool. It's not just passing information, it's sharing information. And it's sharing a common history that we all share. And it opens up a, a path to a discussion because one recognizes in themselves and in their past similar um, struggles and uh, you know opportunities and missed opportunities and you know there's also the part about no one ever asked what experiences do you have in your, I'm looking over here at the students, in your everyday life, on campus or off, that you feel is, let's say, a microaggression. A microaggression. So it's not maybe a blatant attack upon you, but you're aware that there is a little bit of a pulling back. And once you start that conversation, um, the classrooms have just, they just start pouring out experience. And because you've given them permission. And you said, it's okay because we aren't gonna judge you. We're just gonna listen. And we're gonna figure this out together if we can. And, you know, it's, it has to come in terms of the classroom, it has to come from the students because it's your lived experience and your future. And all we can do in our role as descendants of this very infamous case is recognize and share with you that we've, we came together even though the, in the public's eye, we never should have, but we came together and it wasn't difficult to reach a place of common ground, unity and hope. So, you know, I can't, we can't speak to how you should write your curricula or, um, you know, what, what to include in your historic narrative. Um, we can just tell you our story. And, um, and so that's kind of how they think we, we choose to, to teach the history. Okay, do you have anything? To that, um, you know, from our own experiences, from our own experiences, and combined with, to be honest with you, what I witnessed right here today. And that's just simply having the capacity to love. And somebody has to be first. You know, if, if it doesn't happen, well, somebody in the room has to step up. And what I saw here in demonstration today amongst the students was the fact that you have here a faculty that knows how to love the students and showing that love in first, being the first at it. And then a lot of times if somebody's not used to that kind of atmosphere, 
you, you kind of invite them in and they have a chance to open up. And what I saw the students do today was open up to the fact that when they were treated right, they responded by treating others. And somebody has to step up first. That's all I can say. You know? if, if it's not in the room, well, you know, sometimes it's not as good. <laughs> but at least if you try, you know, to hear each other out. Or just be the first one to administer some love toward the other person. That's lovely, yeah. Um, what do you see as some of the obstacles in schools about educating about racism, past and present? Um, since you have spoken around the country and internationally, are there any common or distinct issues you see as impacting specific places? And what do you recommend to folks in a state where the current government is trying to restrict discussions about racism in the curriculum? <laughs> Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> no, um, those questions come up, but I think the good thing is to have a forum where you talk. And like, just like I said before, the conversation has to open up. And the most success might be just starting the conversation. You may not get there at first on that first round of conversation, but if people are willing to sit down and talk, you know, because I think the damage that was done to America with the, the decision of separate but equal and other states adopting those type laws is that when people are separated, they don't know anything about each other. And if you get them in a room and they get a chance to talk to each other, they find that they have more things in common than, than they don't. So, you know, I think just opening the conversation, just having a conversation, I think that's where we have been successful, not so much just with our relationship, but opening forums to the public where it's open to everybody. Every event that we've ever given has been open and free to the public. Any food we serve, any drinks we have, it's all open and free to the public. So I've had, in my experience, working in the hotel industry for over 42 years, um, I've had some staunch Republicans come back while I'm on the job because they know me and they work in the community and they always said that they enjoy our events because it was so open and free to everybody and it didn't restrict anybody to come and nobody had a special way to say something. We just spoke our hearts and their minds and as a result, all those meetings and classic days we celebrated and other events that we gave, as a result, and I have to say the track record with us, I know you have a lot of resistance with, you know, now with the books being removed from libraries and all these other things, but I'll just to simply say our Walker Project has taken a state like Louisiana who wants to remove books and wants to restrict things on education but at the same time, they approve every marker we put out there because we have to go through them to get approval. And each time they say, oh, great marker. But now you're teaching what you're saying you don't want to teach. <laughs> because everybody in the public is walking by the marker and they're reading the truth. And that's what sets people free. We just got to be truthful with each other, honest. And you know, like I said, the, the biggest ingredient is it's love. I don't know, you know, sometimes it's hard for a person that they had a hard life to know to love someone else. But well, we'll see how it's the most powerful goes. thing. We'll see. We'll see, Keith. Because, you know, a lot has changed since we applied for our newest marker that's going to be unveiled in July, which is on the 1866 massacre that took place um, right after um, emancipation and uh, newly freed. Uh, it's like people were uh, exercising their right to vote. And so all over the South, there were these horrendous massacres in which people were just gunned down um, in their effort to either convene or to vote or, you know. And so this marker is uh, very explicit about the violence that took place and that, and who the victims were and who the um, uh, attackers were, you know? There's a white mob who did this. 
and we, there are a series of markers that we want to put up. This, our own markers aren't quite like this. They're about achievement and resistance and civil rights. This one, but it got approved. I'm wondering if our next one is going to get approved. <laughs> Uh, did we get the approval? No, that one's approved. But <laughs> since that was last year, now the state has, you know, they're passing bills to ban the books and to stop teaching black history. That's it. Just stop it. You know, stop teaching black history. Sometimes I Which is American history. <laughs> so that's going to be interesting. Sometimes my ear doesn't hear things. <laughs> anyway, um, with five markers that we accomplished before this first marker for. Um, Massacre. Um, one led to five, so see, I don't know. I say one leads to five. Okay. Well, so, there were three parts to that. Stop, thank you. Oh, yeah, you did a good job. Yeah. Um, here's the last question. Um, so you, you have talked quite a bit about the historical marker project that you've done, um, but can you talk a little bit more about your approach to accurate educational representation of or memorialization of historical events, and then specifically? Um, Keith, you talked about the mural of Homer Plessy, but I heard there's a little story about the art and your drawing, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah, just that story. Let me start with the image of Homer Plessy first, because that's more recent. And um, what we've had for the longest is a problem with a picture of Homer Plessy because there is no picture of Homer Plessy. I have searched for 25 years of my life and found nothing. All his belongings were destroyed. Um, he, he left the shoemaking business and, and was wound up being an insurance salesman for a black insurance company until he died. And we found no pictures of him. But strangely enough, on the Library of Congress website, there's a picture of PBS Pinchback who was formerly a governor of Louisiana for only two months after the governor was impeached because he was a lieutenant previously. So his being born in the same time as Homer Plessy and having somewhat of a complexion comparison, they always have his picture in Homer Plessy. The name of it. It's like, we've had to call, how many times? Two, three. Call the Library of Congress, please remove the picture. It's not him. And so, every yeah. and every teacher yeah. in every classroom across the country is using PBS Pitchback <laughs> as Homer Plessy. And you just gotta think, wait a minute. Well this is famous. not an unknown person. You've got to know this is not. Well, he's famous because he was the only what black uh, governor of a state in US history, I think. That's right. black governor, yeah. right? Anyway, uh, we didn't have another one until 1971. Where, where you were previously, um, he helped design Shreveport. He and C.C. Antoine, another member of the Citizens Committee, when they broke up in 1896 after losing the case. But I mean, he was a, a he was a supporter of the Citizens Committee and the people who shepherded Homer Plessy all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But still not he, Homer he's, he's not Homer Plessy. Still not Homer Plessy. <laughs> <laughs> still not. Homer Plessy. So. Um, I don't know if you're talking about my elementary school experiences. No, I think he's, oh, he's talking? talking about the marker, the mural that we talked about today that um, oh, Lauren wants to Oh, you? Yeah. I didn't realize you were talking about it. We didn't. Yeah. I heard it from someone else. No, anyway, because <laughs> there is an artist by the name of Ian Wilkes who, in the area where Homer Plessing was arrested, across the street from it, there's an area where they allow muralists to just put things on the warehouses. And Ian is a traveling artist, and what he did, he tried to dispel the whole myth about PBS Pitchback by painting a picture of him. I wish I had a PowerPoint or something I could show you. But they did the depiction of PBS Pitchback, and he, without a picture of Homer Plessy, created an image that he thought represented Homer Plessy. And it was eight colors that he did it in, and they always said Homer Plessy was one eight black. So he did eight different colors to say that all colors are inclusive in the rainbow and none are most important. So the eight, he used eight colors and his depiction of Homer Plessy was a bearded guy just like PBS Pinchback. <laughs> but he used the picture, he did a, a rendering of me, he did a rendering of a, 
My great grandfather's picture that I salvaged from Hurricane Katrina. I drew a picture of it once, and we lost the photograph in Hurricane Katrina. But uh, he worked on that. I wish I could show you the picture. It's just it's amazing what he did. We called him today because we wanted to use his depiction of Homer Plessy for a brown bag event at University of New Orleans because we're doing a trail of the Citizens Committee in New Orleans to, to follow the lives of the guys who, who were the guys who actually engineered that case. Homer Plessy was just a plaintiff. But uh, when we decided we were going to do that, uh, I think what did Lauren? Lauren sent us the picture and said, can we use this artwork? So this morning I called Ian and Ian, I texted him first and he shot me, text back, wow, thanks man, I'm so glad you called. So I said, well, hey, and I called him up. I said, Ian, uh, can we use your artwork for the, man, you got a free hand, just do anything you want my artwork. I'm sending you some, some uh, information, blah, blah, blah. So he sends me all the work on his website. His website is ianthepainter.com. <laughs> so if you look at Ian's work, Ian is tremendous. He's a great artist. You know, you know. I, although I'm a rusty artist now, I still have the pleasure of working with some of the greatest artists in New Orleans right now. Because in the area, there's a place called Studio B. And this guy, B Mike, is he's, actually his name is Brandon Odoms. But his nickname is B Mike. And he does some of the most tremendous murals in New Orleans. And the last racial healing event that was held by Kellogg and MSNBC was held in the studio. And we had a chance to attend. And we had one of the Little Rock Nine, um, Minnie Jean Brown, was part of their interview system. Uh, what's the lady, 16, 19 project? Oh, um, Nicole Hannah Yeah, so we had a chance Nicole to sit Hannah in the studio with them and mingle with them. So it was. It was quite an event, yeah. But we got permission to use the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been such a pleasure. First of all, I want to thank you, Elise, for your uh, representing the students and asking the questions. Again, thank you, Andy. I want to thank all of you for coming. But I especially want to thank you, Phoebe and Keith. It's so great that we finally got to bring this back around and get you up here. I, I, I couldn't be happier that you came to really truly share your stories and not just tell stories. It felt like sharing to me and I'm grateful. So could we have a round of applause? Thank you.